Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we return to our study in Judges 15, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance so that we may correctly understand the symbols and the importance of what we are going to be addressing for ourselves, for the world, and for the message that we must be prepared to give. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to assemble together today. We thank you for the example that you have provided us. <clears throat> we ask, Father, today for your direction. Show us this that we need to understand. May your spirit help us to understand. May we be able to look upon these words and look upon these examples to learn more of you, to learn more from you, and to be guided by you for the work that you would have us to do. Father, forgive us of our sin. Help us now that we may learn what it is to become righteous by faith in you, in you alone. May your will be done. I thank you for each one that is assembled together here today and for those that will view these later. Please bless this as it goes out over the internet. Help us so that your character may be shown to all. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> okay. Now we have a brief recap in front of us. At his marriage feast, Samson was brought into familiar association with those who despised the God of Israel. Whoever voluntarily enters into such relations will feel it necessary to conform to some degree to the habits and the customs of his companions. The time thus spent with vain and trifling persons is worse than wasted. Thoughts are entertained, words are spoken, that weaken the citadel of the soul. So, various places, Mrs. White calls this the citadel of the soul. And in others, this is the temple specifically for the Holy Spirit. The wife to whom Samson had transgressed the command of God, the wife to obtain whom Samson had transgressed the command of God, proved treacherous to her husband ere the close of the marriage feast, and was at last put to death by the very class whose threats had caused her perfidy. Samson had already given evidence of his prestigious strength by slaying single-handed a young lion and by killing 30 of the men of Ascalon. Now moved to anger at the barbarous murder of his wife, he attacked the Philistines and smote them with great slaughter. Thus wishing a safe retreat from the Philistines and fearing to trust his own countrymen, he, re he withdrew to a strong rock called Elam, in the tribe of Judah. Now, <clears throat> here Mrs. White writes something that could be se seen as being odd. <clears throat> in this passage from Signs of the Times, she writes he withdrew to a strong rock called Elam. Yet what does the Bible say? Judges 15, 11. 
Then 3,000 men of Judah went to the top of the rock, Etam, and said to Samson, Knowest thou not that the Philistines are rulers over us? What is this that thou hast done unto us? And he said unto them, as they did unto me, so I have done unto them. Now, is this a scribal error that this rock's name is written as Elam in the signs of the times and Etam in the Bible? Is this a correction? Or do they both mean the same thing? What? How are we to look at this? Well, have have you looked at the original article? Because sometimes, uh, when they when they take these articles and they convert them into text and put them on <clears throat> right uh, state site, um, uh, it sometimes gets things wrong. It could be just a typo that's overlooked. Okay. I don't have. A, a copy of the signs of the times from 1881. So I couldn't go to that original article. It's on what? Adventist Di Digital Archives. Okay. So, so I have it here. And? Um, well, I have to find it here. It says Elam. So it could have been a typo originally in the signs of the times itself that got carried over. Kind of interesting if that was the case, since they have to <clears throat> had to set type at that time. Now, is there a difference in the name? Well, yeah. What does Etam mean? Um, here. So Etam means, well, that's the hawk ground. That's the hawk ground? Yeah. H-A-W-K. Yeah. Okay. Where Elam means hidden. <clears throat> okay. Does it mean cave? Okay. So uh, it's hot ground or lair of wild beasts is, is Etam. Now see, depending on the on the way you look at the other, uh, one one group that I'm looking at right now said that Elon was an Assyrian word meaning high. Another that we find this being noted in the war of four against five kings, where you have Ketelamer king of Elam, entering into an alliance with kings Amaraphel, Ariok, and Tidal to do battle against five Canaanite kings from Genesis 14. Yeah. So there's a disagreement regarding Elam, what it's actually from. But uh, can mean hidden according to Strong, right. according to Brown Driver Briggs, it means eternity. Because it, it comes from, it's related to the word Olam, which is eternity. Right. So. Okay. But yeah, I would think that Elam is just a, a typo that showed up in the Signs of the Times article. Uh, and those are common. Um, because they're they're setting the type by hand. Okay. Right. Now here we have three thousand men of Judah that come up against Samson, 
And their comment is, knowest thou not the Philistines are rulers over us? What is this that thou hast done unto us? And he said unto them, as they did unto me, so I have done unto them. <clears throat> now, Samson is viewing the death of his wife very personally. There are 3,000 of the men of Judah that are now coming up against Samson. In this, what kind of a symbol do we see? Those that are of Judah are doing war against Samson in place of the Philistines. Right. So this is God's people fighting against themselves. God's people fighting against a message. Yeah. From God. Mm -hmm. Have we not seen this? in the 1888 time period. Yeah. Well, so you keep bringing us back to Adventist history. Yes. We have understood that Judges is referring specifically to our history. And, and I'm not saying that it doesn't apply to, to those histories because there is obviously a parallel to these different histories. But we would have to look at it, the time in which we're placing this story. This is occurring now. I'm agreeing with you. Yeah, yeah. The so final, that, the, yeah, yeah. So the, it, it did occur, um, but it's now occurred. Okay. Our situation, just like in 1888, a message came from God. The church chose to fight against it to their own detriment. <clears throat> in 1905, a message was given by God to Mrs. White. The church chose to put it aside. In 2018 and 2019, the message of July 18th was given by God. The church chose to fight against the message. The movement right now is still fighting against the message because they don't want to accept it. They don't want to study it further. They're saying, what are you doing to us? They're accepting the leadership of the world in place of the leadership of God. Yeah, so, so we, are, we are in that same situation as in the history from 1888 and onwards. Yes. Right. So, I mean, 1888 marks the end of the first generation. And, and they were given a message that could have led to uh, a revival and reformation. But because right. they rejected the first two messages, they couldn't accept the third. <laughs> exactly. And the thing that, that, that I see within this movement is that there's a rejection of the first and second angels' messages, but it's not recognized that they've rejected it. They think that they have accepted the first and second angels' messages. Right. But they haven't. And that's why they can't understand the third. They can't receive it. Just as, as we've looked at history in the past, and here again, I, I apply a, a very direct comment. Those that refuse to learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. 
if we are unwilling to learn the lesson of what occurred in 1863, in 1888, in 1919, in 1957, we will be doomed again to be repeating those errors. And see, the problem is not necessarily an intellectual one either. I mean, intellectual part shows up. But um, when we look at um, when we look at what's being presented, and, and, and I'm not trying to be critical of, of things, but I'm just going to use Daniel Fontenot. His message is there's nothing wrong with them. No. Right? It's good, solid Adventism, lots of spirit of prophecy. But he's critical of things that he doesn't fully understand. And Ellen White says, if you reject new light, you didn't fully understand old light. So you can present old light correctly, but that's not enough. Right. And, 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 and it's the thing that, that, you know, I just, I have this great problem with because I've, I, you know, when I look at Daniel Fontenot and I watch his videos, it's it's standard Adventism. There's not there's not something you can say. Oh, he's off here, but there is something that's being missed. And and he does accept July eighteenth. You know that is being correct. He you know that that this movement has you know can't reject July eighteenth. And yet he in a sense does reject it because he's rejecting the light that comes from an understanding of July eighteenth. So you, you can't say that you accept July 18th, but yet the light that comes from July 18th, you set aside. That you, you not, not even that just that you diminish it, you just completely ignore it. And, and so that's the problem with Adventism in 1888. That's the problem that, that exists in this movement today. It's, it's always existed. When it comes to new light, we don't know what to do with it. And, and we think that it's an undoing of old light because it doesn't fit in our thinking. But the problem is we don't understand the old light. And if we, if we accepted this new light, we would see that old night light just shine so much brighter. And we could rejoice in it. We would see that the foundation is laid correctly. Everything is correct. So there's just this, this problem that we have as Seventh-day Adventists in this. And, and, and I think it's as human beings, of course, because light is going to shine in the darkness and it's going to cause us to have to repent and forsake our sins, our pride, our petty little opinions. They're going to have to be set aside in the light that comes from the midnight cry that shines all along the path. And, and I don't know really what to do other than to follow it myself. But you can see when you're following it, it causes this division from others who aren't. And it comes to the point where we see people turning against the message and and they don't realize that they are so it, it's a grave danger we have to learn from those lessons of the past we have to learn from these past histories and yet we can do it we can be fulfilling prophecy like the declaration of december 6 2020 i mean it's really clear that they're fulfilling prophecy, that they're doing the very thing that was prophesied. And, and they're also doing it on a date that's prophetic in its symbolism. Right. But they can't help themselves. They are more addicted to the milk 
and they are rejecting the meat. Mm. And, and the milk was nourishing at one point. At one point. <clears throat> but at a certain point, you have to become mature. Yep. We cannot remain as toddlers forever. At some point, we have to grow up. And remaining as a spiritual toddler, while some view this as a worthwhile thing, it means that when the meat is being presented and we are rejecting the meat, as it has been set aside many times in the past, and as we're observing it being set aside within the movement, it does not allow us to progress further in the light that is shining ever so bright behind us. Well, we just don't <clears throat> want to be corrected. Sometimes that's the case. Because our very ego doesn't like the idea that we have to be corrected. So, <clears throat> the 3,000 men of Judah are now standing against Samson. The one that would save them the one that would show them the light is the one that they are standing against. <clears throat> and they said unto him, we are come down to bind thee that we may deliver thee into the hand of the Philistines. And Samson said unto them, swear unto me that ye will not fall upon me yourselves. Samson's giving them a huge out. Is Samson a message? I would say in this case, he's a message and he's a messenger. Well, sometimes it's hard to separate the two because you have a message that's being given. Right. And one of the things that people do is they attack the messenger. Right through gossip, rumors, all these types of things. But what we can't do is we can't take Samson and, and say that he's a specific person or a specific um, group of people. It's a message. And, and none of us are tied to a message just because we proclaim it. We could easily, easily be on the other side and not, not realize it. Mm -hmm. so, so it has to be a message. That, that Samson represents. So what message do we have that the Philistines have taken over? Well, first, what we have to look at is we have this message, Samson being a message that has directly upset the Philistines but it has also upset the movement. Now, in the years that, that I have been around this movement, the book of Joel was one that created a division between the path of the just, between many of the other offshoot ministries that we found out of California. I had a conversation yesterday afternoon, yeah, actually yesterday evening with a sister, <clears throat> where there'd been a party that had been giving presentations to a small group north of me. And the presenter became very agitated and told those to whom he was presenting that they should not study the book of Joel. 
that he would reveal to them what the book of Joel actually had to say. <clears throat> now, there were some other parts of this in this conversation where it became very evident that this presenter was very much off the path. The message that we have here that has created such a division has been <clears throat> the message of July 18th that reveals that Nashville is going to be destroyed. The world sees this as lunacy. The church sees this as an embarrassment. The movement has divided over the message. So here we have a situation. We are repeating exactly what was happening here. So if, if I was going to apply something here, the message of Samson, the message that Samson is giving is that God is going to do exactly as he says he is going to do. The world thinks that's crazy. The church sees that as an embarrassment and the movement doesn't know what to do with it. So, so more specifically, when we look at, because trying to understand who the Philistines represent, um, I mean, they definitely don't represent the movement. No, they don't. And, and they can represent uh, the church that has departed from God. There is a similarity between the worship of, of the Philistines and what happened in the false worship of the Israelites. Um, but uh, the main point here is that the message of Samson is the message of July 18th, basically the proclamation of July 18th, which the world heard and rejected and opposed. But now within the movement, we have this division that occurs and we have the this riddle which which to me has to be this test where we have to choose how we are going to study and understand the scriptures and this is showing us something that's still future within this movement when the movement turns against the message. Now it's partly, has partly done that with the de declaration of December 6, 2020, but it's still continuing down that course. So there's some things here that I don't fully understand because I, because they're future um, and they haven't happened. It's hard to, to know exactly what they mean, but we're gonna see, you know, what happens to him and what the symbols are and try to understand these 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 symbols because in some ways the story of samson keeps repeating and enlarging as well so it's not just necessarily a continuous story about what happens in the movement it, it goes back and repeats with different illustrations the same events so that's what we're trying to discern and it's going to take us a bit of time to put this all together the whole story of samson Does that so, give, go, go ahead. When you see the, the Judah talk about um, and going to Edom, is that them going to study? I would say since this, this was a known place within Judah, that this would be their knowledge that 
this is occurring, but they're not wanting to accept the symbol for what it is. Because we're told to go to the mountain. Is the mountain, this the mountain in the city? I don't know. I'm not recalling directly the what the symbol of the mountain would represent. I'm looking at this on the 3,000 men of Judah being the test similar to the test that was given to the 300 of Gideon. Are you going to have faith that God is leading? Are you going to believe that God is actively providing for your best interest? Okay. So in this situation, the 3,000 men of Judah, they're not just questioning Samson, they're questioning God. Because who was their king at this time? Who was the king of Israel at the time of Samson? Okay, what, what do you mean who's the king of Israel at the time of Samson? We don't have a king. Wasn't God their king? Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, God's their king. Yeah. Yet they have chosen to state, knowest, now, knowest thou not that the Philistines are rulers over us? They have set aside God as their sovereign and chosen to accept idolaters as their sovereign. Their condition is that they are totally blind. They are blinded by their own choices as to who their sovereign is and where their faith is supposed to be. So are these 3,000 men of Judah righteous by their faith? Or are they unrighteous? Got to be unrighteous. Exactly. And they spake unto him, saying, no, but we will bind thee fast and deliver thee into their hand. But surely we will not kill thee. And they bound him with two new cords and brought him up from the rock. What do these two new cords represent? I mean, I'm, I'm seeing all sorts of symbolism of a Sunday law. Okay. Um... I don't see that. Can you explain the symbols of the Sunday law? Okay. One of the things that Mrs. White has been very clear about, when it comes down to the Sunday law, that this <clears throat> will involve a people largely unknown to the world. Now, Future for America that ministry, as of July 18th of 2020, was fairly well known to the world. This movement in these of us that are continuing to study are very largely unknown to the world, but we are still known to others from the movement and some of the church. Here is Samson. He is known to the world. But the men of Judah 
those that should have been supporting him are now seeking to bind him so that they he can be delivered up. Why are they going to deliver him up to the Philistines? So that he can be killed. So there is a, a, a type of a death decree, but it's coming from the from those that should have been supportive of Samson to bring him before the world. Okay. So um, I, I still don't. I still don't follow how this is the Sunday law because I don't see it here. Is there not? Is there not a party looking to put another party to death? Yes, but this is this is talking about this movement within this movement. We don't have a Sunday law in this movement, other than typical. Typical, yes. Yeah. But so so what we have here is he's going to be bound right. with these two new cords. Right. So why two new cords? And and new, of course, referring to something that's um, a new thing, fresh. Is this not a type of a doubling? Well. Well, it's, it is a type of a doubling, but the idea of a cord is cord is something that's entwined, right? So a cord is, is like a rope. Um, it's something that's been bound together, twisted uh, to make this rope or this cord, right? But this is new, and, and you're going to see the jawbone is also new though it uses a different word, but it's, it's something that's been unused or moist, uh, properly dripping, hence fresh. So, it's, um, so you're going to have these things that are new, these new cords. And, and we're also going to see that it's, of course, the jawbone of an ass, which is going to refer to Islam. Right. Um, so... So we're going to have these two new cords that that are that are going to bind this message. It's going to be bound by these whatever these two new cords are. Um, and when we go back to the riddle again, I would see this as as relating to uh, the messages of Odilio and Colin as being these two new chords, but that's just my understanding at this point. Interesting application. <clears throat> so they've now bound him with two new chords and brought him up from the rock. And we, when he, or, came, go ahead. Or would it be the two different views on, on the, message it couldn't be the two different views it has to be the two new chords because these are new lines right that are intertwined um with the message and and so that they have aspects of truth right they're new new interpretations of prophecy new lines um but they they bind the message because it locks the message in until these until these predictions um, pass, the message for the present time is being bound, and that's why when we get to uh, 2023 and we see the failure of these predictions, only then can the message come forth and. Uh, be, be understood, be proclaimed. Okay. Because remember, this is Judah binding Samson with two new cords. 
And since Samson is the message of July 18th, it can't be two different views that are in contention. Though we, we can see that there's a parallel to the riddles because the riddles are presenting two different choices. Uh, one is, you know, Stephen's affirmation of um, our lines compared to Collins' uh, Trump prediction. That both happened on December 25th, 2021. So that's how I would look at it. Okay. And we, when he came unto Lehi, or Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire, and his bands loosed from off his hands, or in the alternate, were melted from off his hands. <clears throat> What is the meaning of Lehi? Well, that is the jaw. The jawbone. Yeah. Okay. So they bring him to the jawbone. The Philistines have shouted against him. The spirit of the Lord has now come upon him. And the cords that were binding him are now melted from off his hands. What do we see here? What else, what else can we say here? Well, this would agree with what I've said regarding these, what these cords are, that they do bind the message of July 18th for a time. And, and, and that's the way I personally felt as far as what happened when Colin made his uh, prediction. And Odilio uh, presented his study dealing with uh, uh, the mandates in that I realized I had to be patient because these were attractive. One is they were using elements of truth and, and they were based upon light, like real light, not false light. But the conclusions being drawn were in error. And... And all I could see is that we would have to wait. We'd have to wait to see these things work out. Um, because it was pretty clear that they were in error in what they were predicting. And, and we don't have really long to, to see that, that what's being predicted about the election here and, and what's going to happen with the pandemic, that these ideas are wrong. They're not going to lead in the direction that many people in the movement believe that they're going to lead because they're looking at a Sunday law coming right away, and it's not. So once these predictions fail, then we have this opportunity to give this message, for the message to blossom and grow. Because we need this message. If this movement is going to accomplish its task, all of these things that we have been studying have to be understood by the movement. They can't be set aside for these more attractive, from a human nature point of view, more attractive ideas. And they're only attractive because they appeal to our human nature. It's the human nature that needs to be set aside so that the nature of God, the character of God, can then be revealed. Yeah, a righteousness by faith that appeals to our nature is not righteousness by faith. No, not at all. It appeals to our pride, to our natural sentiments. It's not righteousness by faith. That when we... When we really truly see Christ, when we have that mare vision, we are undone. We, we don't believe that we can even survive because we will see ourselves as we truly are. And, and that's, that's scary. 
Yeah, it's not something that we want. No. Human nature shuns this. But we keep building ideas and opinions that that support our pride, our ego. And that has to be stripped away. And that's not an easy thing for anyone. No. So they bring him to the jawbone. The Philistines are shouted against him. And the bonds are melted from off of his hands. They are like flax that have been burned with fire. I mean, this, and I'm not saying what's going to happen as far as when Nashville is going to be destroyed, but these are symbols that we could attach to Nash Nashville. Exactly. And, and so maybe it's the message of Nashville will once again be revived in some way, in some, some of the, something in our understanding that we don't yet have. Because God has more light for us. Very true. Now, to this place, he was pursued by a large body of Philistines, whose presence excited great alarm among the inhabitants of Judah. When they learned that the sole object of the invasion was to take Samson captive, they basely agreed to deliver him up to his enemies. In so doing, they hoped to secure the favor of the Philistines and thus lighten their own oppression. Accordingly, 3,000 men of Judah went up to take the mighty warrior. But even at such odds, they dared to make the attempt only because they felt assured that he would not harm his own people. Samson consented to be bound and delivered to the Philistines, but first exacted from the men of Judah a promise not to fall upon him themselves and thus compel him to destroy them. He permitted them to bind with two new ropes and to take him down to the Philistines. Now, if the men of Judah have basely agreed to deliver Samson to the Philistines, can it be said that these men of Judah have entered into a covenant with the Philistines against this message? Well, yes. Is that clear to everybody? Yes, I can see that at this point. Okay, so the point being. I can see it too. What was that? Sorry, William. I said I can see it too. Okay. Well, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, William. I appreciate the, the input. Now, the point here. <clears throat> we are not to enter into covenant with those that do not believe and that are not studying as we are. Now, I, I have a friend. He, he's, he's actually coming on Sabbath. Um, he's a Sabbath keeper. He's actually a guitar student of mine years ago, 25 years ago. Um, now, he... Um, He's a Q conspiracy theorist. He's also messianic. And um, really what this message regarding Trump's reelection is something that, you know, that, that Colin's presenting is not something unique to this movement. 
No, it's actually it's completely in line, and much of the other things as well are completely in line with the Q conspiracy. And the Q, Q conspiracy is completely false. It's not based on any kind of reality. But um, to me, that's what that the Trump prediction is in line. It's an alliance with the Philistines in that context. Okay. This is getting confusing because we keep going back from to July and then to now. <laughs> well, but it is about July. So what what has happened is on December 25th, 2021, this movement had an opportunity to look at the light that had come from July 18th, but they rejected that opportunity. They didn't want the two groups or the three groups or whatever you want to look at it as to come together on December 25th, 2021 and present together. This was a proposal that was given. They chose not to do that. They didn't want to have any association with our study group. Um, but on December 25th, God gave light. And, and some of that light actually came through Colin because what he was presenting was light. But that light could only be understood in the context of what the light that Stephen had been given. Those two things, all of those things had to come together for us to understand what July 18th was about. But when you rejected the light that had been coming from July 18th, there was no way that they could understand the light that was being given to Colin, because I believe God was giving Colin light. But that light became distorted. It was put in a wrong context. And so when we look at July 18th, what has been happening in this movement since December 25th, 2021, is a rejection of July 18th. But it's a test that's put before this movement. And, and we have to wait until this prediction has run its course for the movement to realize its mistake. So it is still about July 18th, but it is about the present as well. The two are tied together. You can't really separate them. I don't know anyone in the group that rejects July 18th. Right. So, so you're correct. They will say they accept July 18th, but the light that has come from July 18th, they're not even aware of. That's the problem because they won't listen to it. So when we, when you look at the Trump prediction, the problem with it is it, rec it doesn't recognize that we are in a typical line. Same with Odilio's even though that's what the light that they're sharing tells us. They try to say, we're, leading, we're going right directly to the Sunday law. The pandemic is leading to the Sunday law. Trump is going to bring us into the Sunday law. But if they had understood July 18th correctly, and all of the, the lines that have been given uh, to this movement, they would have a way of understanding what Colin was presenting. So when Colin presented on December 25th, 2021, and I was there, and I'm, I'm pointing out this is light because there was a resistance to what Colin was presenting by many. And I was trying to explain why Colin was correct. But there was one point that Colin presented that I wanted him to explain, and he wouldn't explain. And, and then I was told, to basically shut up, right? They shut me down. And, and that was a mistake because what I was trying to point out is where that light was going, why it was important to listen to what Colin was saying, but also where Colin had drawn a wrong conclusion. And it's only because Colin was not aware of something. So, so this movement has been put into a holding pattern that's going to basically take 
you know, over a year uh, to get out of. So people may say they believe in July 18, but it doesn't mean they do. Because if you're opposing the light from July 18th, you can't possibly believe in it. I think we've seen a lot of that, especially in those that chose their pronouncement on December 6th. While they want to agree that yes, Mrs. White has given this warning. They wish to set aside the fact that the warning needed to go out and to be tied to time so that it would have the impact of telling people to pay attention. I've had several people in the Canadian group who have reiterated the exact same ideas in the De December 6th declaration regarding the chronology. Right. And, and, and also downplaying its importance. How so, can you have Palmoni, how, how can you have Palmoni if you do not have numbers? Right. So they may on the one hand, accept July 18th to a certain point, but any of these, these, um, this other light dealing with numbers, uh, the 777 chiasm, the one starting on December 21st, 2021, all these other things, uh, they just don't accept. And, and you can't, you can't say that you accept something, but you reject the principles upon which it is built. You can't say I accept July 18th, but I don't like the chronology. It's too complicated. Well, the chronology was given us by God. Well, isn't, isn't that the same as saying, I love the wonderful number, but I don't like the numbers? Yeah, it's just, I mean, we had it quite clear. I mean, we had a five hour study where it was quite clear that all of this stuff that I was doing was too complicated and that we needed to make it, I needed to make it simpler so people could understand it. And that if I couldn't do that, there was no reason that they should accept it. And yet it's, it is complicated, but it's not something I created. I'm working very hard to make it simpler, to be easier to be understood, but it doesn't, didn't originate with me. Right. <clears throat> right. So I'm not responsible for what God has put in his word that's complicated or hard to understand. These things are hidden and we have to dig for them. But to sort of blame me for making it complicated, to me that's just silly because all I've ever tried to do is make it understandable so that everyone could access this understanding of chronology and under so study it for themselves so that they can see that it is true. But that, but that is the problem, is it's opposition against a person instead of actually addressing the message itself. And so that's where, why we're stuck in this, this holding pattern. But the movement has to come to the upper room. It has to, it has to break these bonds. If this work is going to be accomplished at all, it can never be accomplished in the way that it's been uh, tried at present. Right. I'm sorry I get a little bit passionate about this, but I mean, this is my a whole life. Bit, a little bit passionate? Yeah. yeah, well, this is my whole life, right? Okay. I don't think it's a bad thing to be passionate about it. So now, and he found a new jawbone of an ass and put forth his hand and took it and slew a thousand men therewith. But this word new, as you pointed out, is not the new that we just talked about with the new cords. This is a moist jawbone of an ass. 
So in other words, the ass had been recently slaughtered. Now, he was led into the, the camp. The ass is a, the symbol, right? The ass is a symbol of Islam, yes. Would you see it as any other symbol? No. Okay. He was led into the camp of his enemies amid demonstrations of great joy. Think about that for a moment. He is, Samson is being led by 3,000 men of Judah into the camp of the Philistines. His own countrymen are leading Samson to his purported death. But while their shouts were waking the echoes of the hills, the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Samson. He burst asunder the strong new cords as if they had been flax burned in the fire. Then seizing the first weapon at hand, <clears throat> which though only the jawbone of an ass was rendered more effective than sword or spear, he smote the Philistines on every side until they fled in terror, leaving a thousand of their number dead on the field. The numbers that we have so far. Here we have a thousand dead on the field. We had 30 men of Ascalon that were killed. How many others does it say at this point that Samson has now destroyed? Well, as Stephen pointed out, it's, uh, it's going to be 4,030. That are that are numbered. Of course, there are more, but right. there's four thousand and thirty that are numbered. Right. And, and he pointed out that this is a symbol of Islam, because three hundred and ninety-one uh, years on our calendar are four hundred and three years on the Islamic calendar. Okay. So if we take that second woe three ninety-one, it's also four hundred and three. So four hundred and three is a symbol of three ninety-one. They are symbols that are equivalent, right? Correct. Okay. This next paragraph is the most telling. Had the Israelites been prepared to unite with Samson and follow up the victory gained, they might at this time have freed themselves from the power of the Philistines. Because the men of Judah did not choose to follow up and accept the victory that was being gained by the Spirit of God through Samson, they chose to remain in bondage to the Philistines. But they had become weak and discouraged. They had basely neglected the work which God had commanded them to perform with diligence, thoroughness, and valor. Not only failing to dispossess the heathen, but uniting with them in their degrading practices, tolerating their cruelty. And so long as it was not directed against themselves, even countenancing their injustice. When at last the tyrant power was triumphant, Israel submitted to the degradation which they might have escaped had they only obeyed God. Even when the Lord raised up a deliverer for them, they would frequently desert the one chosen to set things in order 
and would unite with their bitterest oppressors. Everything that's written in this paragraph is damning upon the Israel of the past and the Israel of now. Had the movement prepared to unite with the message of July 18th and follow up the victory the message that was presented. I'm confused here because um, we're mixing up. Um, Israel is that SDA and then Judah is the movement. I don't know. Because sometimes you guys mix them up and I you get confused. Well, okay, Israel, yes would be a symbol at this point of the corporate church. Judah at this point would be a symbol of the movement. Yeah, it, it always depends on which line you're looking at. So, I mean, on larger lines, it, Israel is going to represent the Protestants, the false prophet, right, right. northern Israel. And Judah is going to represent uh, the SDA church, um, Adventists, you know, in Millerite history. But we're not looking at that here. We're looking at, at the history that we are presently involved in. Right. Yeah. So that's why we would, we would make that distinction that it's, Judah is going to represent the movement itself. Because it's taking that role. Exactly. Symbols can have more than one meaning. And that's one of, the, one of the points that we need to keep in mind as we are examining the items that are being put before us. They had become weak and discouraged. Two thousand twenty, the corporate church, when the government said not to assemble together, what was the pronouncement of the church? Was not the pronouncement to shut down the churches? Yet what does scripture tell us? Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Are we supposed to stop assembling? Are we supposed to stop studying because the government tells us to? Who are we to obey? Are we to obey man or are we to obey God? Are we to become weak and discouraged because things are not going exactly the way we think they should be? Or are we to praise God in all things? Especially when the tests come upon us. If someone has basely neglected the work that God commanded them to perform, are they not ignoring the word of God? If those who acknowledge God would but obey his voice, how much suffering might be spared them? God's eye is fixed upon every individual and everyone must render an account to him for all they do and for what they permit themselves to be. 
wherever we are in storehouse and workshop, in all our business, every day in the week and every hour in the day, his eye scrutinizes all our works. His ear listens to our every word. In the deepest solitude, every act and word of our lives has still one witness, the infinite God. When we are true to the high destiny which he has marked out for us, we become co-laborers with him. If our responsibility be fully and heartily accepted and faithfully discharged, it will secure for us the joyful commendation by the majesty of heaven, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Is there any question of what was just read? The point is, no matter how we're looking at this history, The Protestants did not do the work that was handed to them. That work then fell to the Millerites. The Millerites were given a message. And that same message passed on then into the corporate church. But this message has not been faithfully rendered. That message then fell to the movement. The movement is currently fractured because many do not wish to have to give this message. We are studying now to prove to ourselves that God is willing and able to do exactly as he promises. And to ask ourselves the question, are we willing to obey the word of God, even if it contradicts what we think that word should be? I think that's why we're here and these studies are all about, you know. Agreed. Well, it's interesting. I was just reading Psalm 91 um, because he kills a thousand, thousand men, right? And right. it says, a thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, right. but it shall not come nigh thee. Now, here the thousand fall at thy side, which is just thy side, and then... 10,000 at thy right hand, which is, of course, right hand refers to the south. Um, and there's, there's lots in this psalm. Of course, we have the symbol of the arrows, which represents Islam. We also have um, uh, the lion, the adder, the young lion, the dragon, uh, these different symbols that we see other places. Um, now, we know this is really about the Sunday law, Psalm 91, right? Right. I mean, that's, that's my understanding of it. Um, but we know we are in a type of the Sunday law within this movement. Because this movement is typical of what's going to happen. And even if a thousand fall at our, at our side, we do not need to be afraid. I guess part of the, the part of the point is when we read this statement, about the responsibility, you know, I, I often fear that this movement is not going to accomplish its task. Why? Well, just from a human point of view, right? But I know with God, all things are possible. Right. But, but, but you look at the situation and you look at, at our faults, our frailties. I mean, it's, um, you know, how are we going to be able to 
to accomplish the task of warning both the Adventist church and also the world. And the one thing that's clear is we can't possibly have a Sunday law now because the job hasn't been done. It's like expecting a harvest when you haven't even planted, when you haven't even broken up the soil. It's, it's presumption. And yet this movement believes that somehow we're all going to be vindicated and there will be this Sunday law and we'll be able to stand. And yet we haven't done anything that God has asked us to do. We've, we've gone quite the opposite direction. So how God's going to bring it about and correct it, that's the thing that I'm interested to see. Okay. Does it sound like this um, message is coming to fruition? Uh, the message is coming to fruition as far as in what way? That it, it, it says somewhere it ceases, right? Um, not sure which what you're referring to here. You just have to explain a bit more so I can answer the question. I'm not sure what you're asking. If it's a July message, will it come to, will it, it's going to come? Yes. Yeah, it will. But this, but as far as a Sunday law, um, in order for a Sunday law to come, the movement will have, will have had to, there's, there's a huge job ahead of us that no one is doing. Right? We're not giving a message to the Levites or to the world. We're warning no one, and yet we believe a Sunday law is coming. Where is our activity? Where is our publications? Um, what are we doing to warn the world? Where is our unity? Have we come to the upper room yet? I mean, we can't expect Pentecost if we haven't come to the upper room, if we're still fighting amongst ourselves. So the movement itself is in a terrible shape. And, and the point in which we're at is the movement has been for a while. It's been to early writings, page 74. So at that point, the Adventists were still divided. James and Ellen White just began publishing the Review and Herald. So, so that's where we are, we're at right now. So to talk about, as they were doing, they were talking about the second coming happening right away. They, they predicted 1851, you know, seven years after 1844. Joseph Bates was even caught up in that. So, so the movement is still trying to say, well, we weren't wrong. So the stuff that we said was going to happen with Trump or whatever is going to still happen. And yet the movement is divided. It's not accomplishing its task. There can be no time proclamation, as Ellen White says. Christ isn't returning in 1851. She's quite clear about that. So to me, I see the direct parallel with that history and our history. So yes, the, the message will accomplish its task, but we first have to accomplish our tasks that are put before us, and we're not doing that. Okay. <clears throat> And Samson said, with the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps, or an heap to heaps, with the jaw of an ass, have I slain a thousand men. With the symbol of Islam, I have brought the message forward. 
And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking that he cast away the jawbone out of his hand and called the place Ramoth Lehi, or that is the lifting up of the jawbone or the casting away of the jawbone. Now, what happens when you cast something away? What happens when you lift something up? Yeah, I, I don't think casting away is a good translation. Okay. Um, because this word, Ramoth, is usually like the ascent of like a going up to a place. Right. right? It's, it's like a path going up a hill. It, As in Ramath Gilead. Yeah, in Ramoth Gilead, in Ramoth Lehi. So I, I don't see that there's any support for the idea that it's a casting away. Uh, you just won't find an example of that. Okay. Um, so, but it is a lifting up or a, an ascent of the jawbone. And, and, and they would name it this place because it's, it's the going up to, to Lehi, which is the jaw, so, or the jawbone. So now, here is Samson. He has lifted up the jawbone. <clears throat> he has brought the message front and center because of Islam. Is that not what was expected? when the message of July 18th was being promoted, that we were going to see Islam again come front and center. How many of us really were paying attention to Islam prior to September 11, 2001? I know that I wasn't. Prophetically, I don't think Adventism was, was even, it was in, anywhere on the radar. Well, especially prophetically within Adventism, the church had become weak and discouraged. Why else would they then have chosen to begin instructing others in spiritual formation? Yeah, but, but I'm saying even within conservative Adventist ranks, uh, there wasn't an interest in, in Islam. I mean, even in conservative Adventist ranks, most Adventists, conservative Adventists that I knew, uh, had rejected the pioneer view of the trumpets even, which, which I find odd, but it was the case. Um, they were looking at the trumpets as something and, and basically had just discounted that whole um, interpretation of Josiah Litch's. I mean, there was obviously some who accepted it, but in, in this, you know, definitely in Washington, uh, the different ministries there, uh, like light bearers. I mean, they were looking at the trumpets as future. Uh, James Rafferty did a presentation on on um, Revelation nine, where you know he was interpreting the symbols literally, and he was looking at you know this locust as being helicopters and trying to apply it in that way. So Adventism was in confusion because it hadn't returned to the foundation yet. You know, this is in the 80s, right? So um, so it's going to be the message that Jeff gives that's going to return us to the foundation. And it's going to take time. Adventism isn't interested in Millerite history. Even conservative Adventists, they think of the pioneers as, uh, you know, A.T. Jones, E.J. Wagner, and those type of people, when they're not the pioneers at all. Well, they also placed W.W. W. Prescott as a pioneer. Yeah, and 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 um, uh, 
Loughborough, and people like that who are close to being a pioneer. And in, in, in a sense, I could say Loughborough is, but he's still, he's he's not really completely connected with that history. You know, he's probably the, the only one that, you know, you could really do that. Uriah Smith, they have as a pioneer. He's right. not a pioneer. Not at all. Yeah. So, so that's the problem is, is that I had personally, is that I hadn't, I hadn't studied Millerite history. I, I didn't read the Millerite writings, read Miller. I had these impressions that there was lots of error in the writings of the Millerites, which I haven't found yet. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of difficult to find error in with the pioneers, but it's kind of easy to see how the path was abandoned by those that followed the pioneers. Mm -hmm. Now, now we can, but it's only because of the unsealing of the seven thunders, right? Without the unsealing of the seven thunders, we didn't have the keys to look at Millerite history. Um, uh, even that book, Adventist Message, whatever it's called by um, Damsteed. Right. Uh, you know, it's a good book, but he misses the point um, to a large degree because he doesn't have the light that this movement has. So he just doesn't see things that are right under his nose. He doesn't notice those details. Okay. We are coming close to the close of our time together today. Are there any other thoughts, comments, or questions? Any concerns with what we have just been covering? All right, shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, help us not to be weak and discouraged. Help us to look to you and to leave our faith where our faith should be in all ways that our faith should be with you. Direct us now, guide us in that that you would have us to do today. May all that is said and done be to your glory and not to our glory. Help us now, guide us. For without you, we can do nothing. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for the conversations and all that has been done. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.